Yeah. Well, we're sitting in this lovely gallery, Chris Tancock Gallery in uh, near St David's. Yeah, I don't know. Gallery is always a bit. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's just somewhere that I can chat to people. It's amazing how many people just want to come and chat. And people that know my work, and I'm very, very touch wood. I'm lucky I've got around 250 people that collect my work. And of course, they like to come and chat. And, and then I also meet people that don't know anything about my work. And my biggest problem is when you send stuff out into galleries. The, um, it's, it's nice, and I love doing it. But it's, it's a bit like a, a writer being allowed to send a paragraph to this bookshop and a paragraph to that bookshop. And it doesn't really tell anything about the work. Um, so it's nice to be able to say, no, no, this is a whole series or, you know, these images are interconnected. They're not just random series of images. How important is that for you? It's 100%. That's all I'm interested in. Photograph the individual ph photograph is like writing a sentence. It's important, like it is to a writer, but it, but it's no more important than that. I, do, I cannot see how an individual image has any real importance at all. It can get blown up into very important things, but it, it isn't. It's, it's, it's like a sentence. You take a sentence out of a book at random, and I hand it to you. I mean, what can you tell me about the book? Not a lot. No, and you could then use that sentence for hundreds of things. And photography is exactly the same. You take an individual image, put a different piece of text under it and it can be a thousand things to a thousand people mm. uh, because you know images cannot narrate they they can't tell stories on their own and also all I'm interested in telling stories that's that's what I do yeah yeah um, uh, yeah, yeah that um how I'm, I'm gonna ask you to kind of go back a little bit yeah yeah uh, um, how has your past photographic life inform what you do now oh god well, when I started out, I was like everybody else. I believed in the individual image, <laughs> and we all do. Yeah. Um, and then I read Berger, and mm -hmm. that shook my foundations, and I realized, no, actually, you know, it isn't. A, 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 it is, photography's not like art. It's not a painting. The trouble is everybody looks at it as if it's a painting. They're completely different things. You know, painters create... Photographers don't create. We don't create anything. I mean, our cameras do, but that's automatic. I mean, what we do is edit the world. And in that way, we're like writers. Writers have the dictionary, and everything's there in front of them, and they have to edit the words down till it says what they want. We have reality, <laughs> and we have to edit the reality down until it says what we want. Yeah. But we don't create. Uh -huh. I mean, that's why I have slight problems with people that do create and use photography to record it and call themselves photographers. To me, that's art. You know, if you are a conceptual artist and you record your conceptual idea with a camera, yeah. I cannot for life me see that as being photography any more than a doctor x-raying my hand to see where the broken bit is. <laughs> photography, I mean, it is photography, it is. but it's not photography in capital letters. Yeah. Um, um, the, I mean, I am... Um... How long have you lived in Pembrokeshire? Because that, oh yeah yeah okay, that, that's, I kind of because uh, um, uh, I think um, that's the uh, it's the essence of your work in a sense. But isn't it funny? I'm not at all interested in Pembrokeshire, right? Okay. And, and I, don't, I don't mean that wrong. I love Pembrokeshire. Yeah, I love yeah. living here. But yeah. photographically, I'm not interested. Right. I'm not like some of the photographers in Pembrokeshire who you know Pembrokeshire is everything to the photography. Yes, it doesn't matter where I live. Okay, uh, you know. It, I live where I want to live, outside photography. But then when it comes to my photographs, it doesn't matter where I live. You know, <laughs> um, the only thing that's important to me is photography is, is well, I ought to, sorry, I'm, I'm drifting again. I always drift. No, no, it's okay. um, I've lived in Pembrokeshire since 1990, um, and I love living here. Um, but what I'm interested in photographing, and I think it's, similar to a writer again I always come back to writers writers write what they know about mm -hmm. I believe photographers should photograph what they know about they shouldn't photograph what they think is important mm -hmm. which so many photographers do mm -hmm. and I can understand it I've done the same when I was young the you know the terrible thing with photography is there are no famous photographers and people always say don't sit but there isn't you name the most famous photographer in the country at the moment um and you say his name to the general public, 
a fraction of 1% will know who you're talking about. Exactly so, yeah. So, but photographs can become famous, but not because of the photographer, but because of what they photograph. Yes. And so many people choose to photograph things that are important because they know that. They know that they can ride the wave of the thing they're photographing. Mm-hmm. So it can be famous people, famous events. Mm-hmm. Well, it can be things that are controversial that will rub people up the wrong way and will make people look at them. What people don't photograph is the everyday mundane things because because they're harder <laughs> to get people interested in. But that's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in... I mean, I've done so many different things in the past. I've worked for interior magazines, architectural magazines, people like World of Interiors, people like Domus. Um, I've even done a small amount of war photography. Um, but I didn't know anything about any of those things. So what did my photographs look like? They looked like everybody else's. Because I, you know, we all fall back on stereotypes if you don't know what you're doing. And that's what so much photography is. And don't get me wrong, again, it's usually what the photo editors want. You know, the magazine uh, editors, they want images that people have seen before because that will sell the magazine, which is fair enough. But it's not now, it's not what I want to do. So I was brought up on a farm. My father's a gardener um, on an estate. I spent all my time on rivers, mucking about in hedges. I mean, that basically, when it comes down to it, that's what I know about. So, in effect, then, um, uh, what you're saying really is that we are all sort of prisoners of our childhood in many respects. Oh, right? God, yes. We, we, we're all prisoners of what we know. I mean, we may overcome that. You, you may become to know something else extraordinarily well because of circumstance or because of a, a chosen profession or um or you can say oh i'm passionate about this and throw yourself so into it you know more about it than somebody who's known about it all their lives these things are possible mm. the only thing i've ever thrown myself into is my photography so i, <laughs> I have to fall back on my childhood um so i know about the countryside it, it feels right to me so that's what i photograph I'm also a great believer that the adage of the grass is always greener. You know, if I only went to Tibet, oh, my photographs would be so much better. <laughs> um, it, it is nonsense. Yeah. It is easier. I mean, it's so much easier to photograph the exotic. I mean, it, again, you end up with stereotypical photographs. Of course. But it is a hell of a lot easier because it's all new and exciting. Yes. And then you say to somebody, oh, photograph where you live. And I, and they say, I say, where do you live? And they say, oh, Slough. I said, well, photograph Slough. Oh, no, God, I don't want to photograph Slough. A boring, horrible place. (laughs) Well, then photograph a boring, horrible place as a boring, horrible place. I mean... It it, it comes down to your little square mile in a way. Exactly. I mean, I work within a five-mile radius of this house, and I go... Yeah, I was... uh, Because I obviously sort of uh, looked at your work and things, and uh, it's that sort of... um, it's that four squares on a on an OS map. It's 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 that precise and it's that um, psychogeography type elements of uh, that is obvious in your work. I think walking the same paths and uh, you really have to know if you want to see anything, you've got to see it every day. Otherwise, you. I mean, there's a. Um, now, this is why I always get tripped up because I'm going to say a name of a, an artist or a photographer, and it completely goes out my head. Um, Andrew Wyeth, a, an amazing painter from America. I mean, one of the biggest painters, if not one of the most important, but a big painter. And he said, he, pho- he not photographed, he painted his village. And he painted his village for 50 years or something. Um, and he said that I walked past something one day, maybe 20 years ago, and I say to myself, wow, that's going to be a painting one day. But it isn't a painting now. And I feel that when I'm out. I see things that are going to be photographs. But they're not necessarily photographed then. And that's the problem if you go somewhere and you've only got three weeks there. And you go there every day. What's the chance of the thing you want to photograph becoming a photograph? Mm. You know, that you can then make an image out of it. You can take a snapshot. And and you can fall back on cliches again. Um, And, but to get something that, is extraordinary about that object or that or an event. I mean, that's the other thing for me. Events are the most important thing. I know there are people that don't feel the need for events, but 
I really, really have to have an event happening in my photograph. I mean, even if it's something as silly as um, green light coming through the clouds, mm. you know, to me, that's a big event. It and, is, it is. Um, but I couldn't photograph it if there wasn't green light coming through. The, I couldn't say, oh, that's a lovely piece of landscape I mean, mm. with the Quiet Storm project. People are always surprised when I say, I have absolutely no interest in the landscape. I mean, I'm not a landscape photographer. It bores the pants off me. But I have to photograph lighting illusions or whatever you want to call them somewhere. I also have to make a living. So if I, you know, this project's been going 15 years. So if you go back to 2000, when I came up with the idea of the project, I chose 12 locations that I could just use again and again and again. I wouldn't have to ever worry about the location again, but I chose locations, one, that I felt I would be happy going to again and again, but two, had never been photographed before. Now, that was very difficult because, you know, um, so much of photography uh, Pembroke has been photographed, and I don't mean in recent years. I mean, in the past. I mean, Eric Lease, I don't know, mm, you yes, know so, Eric's yeah, work. Yeah, well, yeah. he basically formulated Pembrokeshire and Cardiganshire with unbelievable graphic, gorgeous... I mean, this is crazy. He's not my type of photographer. But I can admire him for what he did. Mm. Um, and But the trouble is, those are his. And then to find other compositions or other views, or whatever you want to call them, of Pembrokeshire is unbelievably difficult. Mm. Um and I can understand why most of the photographers I see just use Eric's compositions, yes. um, which is fair enough. Yes. It's up to them. Well, it's in a way, it's kind of... Um, um, I, I, mean, I would love to live down here. It would be absolutely marvellous. It would be a dream to come true for me um, uh, since it's part of my DNA. Um, um, but when I go to places like Druidston, for example, I will sit for hours just photographing pebbles because <laughs> they, they are the things that are the, the drifts of sand or, wait, yeah. or waiting for tide to go out and waiting. Misty mornings and at Druidston are incredible when the stones start to, you know, the, the tide is going out and these stones appear. Um, uh, amazing place and just photographing, photographing sand and the patterns that are made in sand uh, and to have but there that... again see you're showing a passion for those things that's the important thing. yes indeed yes. I mean I meet so many people when I'm out photographing who, who are looking around trying to find what and I've seen people take out the hard copies of images <laughs> they've seen on Google <laughs> and they're looking to see where they should stand and, and I think why are you doing this yeah um or, or you meet people, and I say, I mean, I, want, I met some people once, a group of people on a, on a um, photographic course that I won't mention the name of, but a very famous one. Uh, and they all had the latest equipment, equipment I couldn't even dream of buying. Um, and I'd been down with, my, uh, with a little miniature Leica, and I'd been putting it down, I had it cling filmed, and I had my hand down in a rock pool, and I was experimenting with the idea of doing waves as they broke over the rock pools in, uh, to see if I because I've got a friend who does similar things, but he puts little characters, you know, architectural characters on it, so you give the illusion of it being a giant wave. But I thought, I'll try it without that. And I said to them, I said, oh, there's amazing things happening down there at low tide, but they wouldn't take their cameras below the high tide mark. No, no. I, I couldn't understand it. Do you, th do you think um, that um, because... Uh, because of this digital age we're living in and the uh, and people expect the immediacy and uh, things to be instant and uh, there's uh, self gratification if you like of uh, in the photographic world that you can go up boom 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 job done and you move on to other things do you think that your type of photography um has it obviously has a place and i admire it very much do you think that people look on you um, as if um, you belong to a, a bygone age? See, I think I belong to the future. I think you do. Um, because repeating images that have been done before, because you can, and because cameras can work like machine guns, and you could hold it up in the air and sway around, and one of those thousands of images you've taken will be beautiful. Yeah. And then you can put that aside and do the same again and again and again. And I've had people that do workshops with me come along and they show me the most gorgeous photographs and I say well how did you get these oh, I have no idea 
you know, they, they don't know how they're doing it. And if you ask them to photograph a particular thing, they wouldn't be able to do it. Mm. Photography, I believe, is going through, or hopefully is going through, a giant revolution at the moment, it, it should be. We, we should be at the stage writing was at when the printing press was invented. The digital camera is like the printing press. When the printing press came into use, suddenly you could produce endless books. But not only that, if you had endless books, you needed endless people to read them. <laughs> so suddenly you had to teach people to read. Mm. I mean, wouldn't it be wonderful if we taught people to read images, mm. to read photographs? But anyway, that's unlikely to happen for a while. But um, now everybody can take photographs. Everybody in the past, Suddenly everybody could write books. Mm. Um, it wasn't an elite thing. You, weren't, you didn't have to be a scribe. Well, when we all started photography, you had to be a scribe. Mm. Um, and, and photography was expensive. Now it's not expensive. Um, like we were saying before, cameras are built into everything. Uh, so, it, and, and then I think the thing is, because photography is going through a revolution, so anybody and everybody can do it, I don't see that as a bad thing at all. I see that as a wonderful thing. What I actually find weird is where people are turning back. And they're thinking, oh, no, I've got to be wet collodion or I've got to do tin types. Or, you know, Cartier Bresson didn't get, pick up his granddad's camera. He went for the latest camera there was, <laughs> um, which was the Leica at the time. So using technology is wonderful. Another thing I'm always being told is, well, how do you not take lots and lots of photographs? Uh, excuse me? <laughs> to start with, how... Do you see that many things to photograph? I never see that many things to photograph. Yeah. So it means they're photographing just pushing the button for the sake of it. Yes. Um, because they can. But that, again, that's not photography. It, photography has come to the point, it has become one of the easiest things in the world to do. I think the only thing that's as easy as photography is writing. Everybody in the country can write, can't we? We all write doesn't mean we're writers, but we can all write and we can use it for everything and anything. And that is wonderful. And photography is the same. It's got to a point now we can use it for everything and anything. You know, you're sat having a meal and you want to quickly fax or not fax this, I'm showing my age. <laughs> you, you want to email or, or send, however, a, a little picture of what you're eating. You can do it instantly. And, and that is wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. The difference, I think, with is that John Blakemore said, I make images, and that's the difference. You know, you can make an image or you can take an image, and they're completely different things. Making a photograph takes a, is unbelievably difficult. I mean, it's extraordinarily difficult. The pressing of the button isn't any more than me writing the word elephant isn't hard. But to write an, a short story about an elephant is quite difficult. Um, without copying somebody else's short story about an elephant. Um, so, for me, the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing about digital photography is I can produce lots of images. Not, I can take lots of images, but over, say, five years with the beating of bounds, I can take 300 photographs, and I can display 300 photographs. Try to imagine displaying 300 photographs in the 70s when I started out. It would have been a nightmare. Mm -hmm. um, and also then publishing a book with 300 images. You know, you'd have just been turned away. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, even now, if I turn to a publisher and say, well, I've taken a book of 300 photographs about, a fee about five fields, you know, their faces go blank. But I don't, it doesn't matter because I can produce it myself. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting that you should say that. That's a really interesting thing because there's a poet from this area called Walter Williams who was a very famous Welsh poet. And he wrote a very lengthy poem about, a very lengthy poem in sort of Canghanedd, which is a Welsh form of uh, writing poetry, um, which a very strict meter indeed. And he wrote about two fields. And it's knowing the area and knowing the stones, knowing every single blade of grass that moves in that Oh, area. God, yeah. I mean, when I was doing the fields, going up there twice a day, every day, and, and not breaking that for five years, and not, you know, I, I mean, I don't know if people know how I did that, but because photography is so easy, I try to constrain myself as much as possible. Now, 15 years ago, the way I constrained myself was to use the same locations again and again, which is a well documented way of taking photographs and then I thought well 
if I'm going to be a photographer, I need to be pushing the boundaries. You know, what's the point otherwise? So I started looking for other, I call them rituals now, rituals that I could use to constrain myself. I mean, all artists constrain themselves, musicians, everybody does. So why shouldn't photographers? You know, why should we think that we can do anything we like? Um, to, and, and, and end up with something that has a focus. It, it, from my experience, it doesn't work. So I started out saying to myself, how can I create a ritual that is appropriate, not just to me, but to my subject? So I started looking at the fields. Now, I chose the fields opposite the house we lived in in Knowlton at the time because they were the nearest fields to me. I, I wouldn't go looking for pretty fields. You know, just they're there. That's what I'm going to do. There were five of them circumvented by road, so that's why it became five. Um, also, I had a word with my agent about it, and uh, he's, <laughs> he said, well, I'm not waiting 10 years for another <laughs> project. So anyway, I decided to do five fields for five years because it was catchy. Um, and then it took me a year to work out the ritual I was going to use, and I decided, because I'd seen him every day I was up there, was the fox. Now, I watched the fox, and every day in the morning, every morning, he'd go out and he'd mark his territory. And then every evening he'd do the same. And by doing it, he created a track. And I noticed that unless he was starving, if there was a rabbit 20 foot to the side, he wouldn't chase that rabbit. That wasn't the job he was doing. He was marking his territory. So I thought, that's a brilliant ritual. I will go out every morning and every night for five years and I will walk the boundaries of the fields. And by doing it, I will create a track. And I did. I set myself the rules that I was not allowed to step off that track. You know, I couldn't think, oh, if I was over there, I'd get a better photograph. You know, as we do, we move around in the landscape. Whatever was in front of me was my composition. I had to make that a photograph. Now, that's unbelievably difficult, mm. but it's unbelievably liberating. It, 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 it really made me think again. I couldn't fall back on all... Because years ago, I realised that I t my best photographs are my subconscious photographs. If I think about things too much, yeah. I bugger everything up. I start yeah. worrying about it. I start thinking, oh, if I only did this, and oh, you know, oh no, that's too difficult. I can't do that. So if I left it to my subconscious, I so I would take headphones and listen to stories that would distract, distract me from what I was doing. Um, and uh, but then I suddenly realised that my subconscious is unbelievably lazy. And it would always just fall back on all those blooming templates. You know, I would find myself, when I started photographing the Dow Rock down here, I went down there. And all my photographs started looking like Faye Godwin's <laughs> photographs of, of um, Thorne Moore that she did an essay on, and which I love. But I don't want my photographs to look like her photographs. So I had to get those out of my system. Where, and the rituals help you do that. So there's me walking my, my path like the fox. I also was not allowed to stop, so I couldn't wait for events to occur. Um, I couldn't double back, you know, if I missed something. Uh, basically, I was walking. Sometimes I have to admit I walk really slowly, <laughs> but, and I could stop for a few secs to take the shot. Um, but basically, the idea was I, it was what was happening within the ritual. I also, and I do this with every project, I choose a camera not a camera I've got necessarily I buy a camera especially for the project because different cameras give you different looks so mm. I chose a Leica for that project and I chose the fixed 100 uh, millimeter lens and I always choose a fixed lens because then I'm forced to see the world in one way for those five years um, so uh, the Dow Rock I'm using a 75 mil lens um, and that fixes me seeing the world and I'm using a Nikon down there because I need low light compared... Well, with the Dowrog, I, I had a tripod on my shoulder, so I could just plonk it down, take the shot. Down here, I've decided that I didn't want to have a tripod. I found it very restricting. Um, but if you haven't got a tripod, you've got to be able to shoot it. So, like, at the moment, I'm trying to photograph um, bats down there. Well, at dusk, it's not easy to handhold a camera and take a photograph of bats, but... Digital technology is amazing. I mean, just imagine in the 70s trying to photograph at 6400 ASA um, and get anything recognisable. Indeed. Yeah. It wouldn't have worked. Not Whereas not this camera gives me stunning images uh, in those conditions. Yeah. I mean, there is a drawback. There's always drawback to everything. When you had a very grainy shot in the past, that grainy shot shouted difficult. 
and people would understand what was happening. Now, it's very difficult to see that photograph of the bat is in dusk because the camera just eats it, you know? So, so where was I? Oh, yeah, back on the, um, on the track. Uh, so I'm walking it twice a day and every day. But the most important thing is I'm seeing the same things and getting to know them. And I know when the fox is going to be there. I know when something's happening over a period. I, and then because it's five years, I, if I miss something this year, it doesn't matter because I, I know about it. And next year, I can be looking out for it. Now, if you go to a new place, you don't know that. You, you, you don't know no. anything. No. Um, so the five years wasn't long enough. Um, and five years isn't long enough to do anything, and I'll never do a project that short again. Um, but at the same time, I'm never going to do a project that's that restrictive. I don't think my wife would let me anyway. You know, the idea of not being only allowed to go out during the day, but having to be there in the morning and the evening for five years. Were they uh, can I uh, were they specific times you were going no, out? Uh, do you know that's how I started? I started out with saying to myself, "Okay, I'm going to go out seven o'clock in the evening." Mm-hmm. And suddenly it was winter. I couldn't see a blooming thing. <laughs> and then I thought, well, I'm being so stupid. I'm, again, basing things on me. The fox wasn't stupid. The fox went out every morning and evening, but he based it on the sun. So it evolved into being around the sun. Um, and um, now, down on the Darog, I chose a different... I'm three years into that now. Um, and I chose a different ritual. I'm using the ritual of the heron. Now, the heron is amazing. I love the way the heron works. He, he uh, tends to focus on one area, um, sometimes for a season, sometimes for a year. So what I've done is the Darog's quite a big place, so I've divided it into three, and I'm going to spend three years on each section. Um, and then the way the heron works, or the way I've seen him work, is that he comes in in the morning, and he sort of just glides about, sussing it out saying oh yeah this is happening today or that's a good spot and then he just plonks himself down and basically he doesn't move till he's full so I do the same I go down with my dogs in the morning I walk my section at the moment I'm just coming up to finishing the section on the uh, where the river Allen runs through the the Dowrog Um, and I I just walk it and I look around and I know what's happening because I've been there every day and I basically say, oh, yeah, that's a good spot for today. And I bring the dogs home. Um, and then I go back down. And I plonk myself down, choose my composition, and then I wait and pray that something will come into the shot. Um, I'm not into following things. I, I cannot be doing with... You know, the two types of photography I, I really struggle with is wildlife and landscape the two sorts of photography i really struggle with and in some ways they're the two things i am working with. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but the problem with i find with a lot not all but a lot of wildlife photography it's a bit like the big white hunter with his trophies yes. they have their thousand mil lens don't they yes. they zoom in yes. as if they got binoculars yes. they absolutely remove the place. Yeah. Um, it's really interesting because um, a, a good friend of mine, and uh, there's an interview with him on Photon, Tim Collier, and he's been working on a on a big series up in because he's from Liverpool, and he used to go bird watching and things. And he is a very very fine um, bird photographer. But he likes um, there's a wonderful shot of some avocets, but they are it's not the classic shot of avocets. It's avocets actually with uh, an industrial background behind them. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's sense of place sense is just place, so important, yes, yeah, it and it's not important that you see every feather on the bird. No, indeed. You know, putting him in context is so much more important. Yeah. I was photographing a, a linnet this morning, or I think it was a skylark, or a pipit, or something. See, I, that's the other thing. I, I don't care what the thing is called. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you know, it's there. It's a little bird, and it, when I get nest, I know where it's nesting on the ground. But whenever I get near when it's nesting, of course, it gets up on a branch and shouts its head off at me. Mm. But I don't want to zoom in on the little bird on the stick, you know, as they call them. I want the, a sense of where it lives. So the bird is tiny in the shot. And some people, you know, may not see it. But that doesn't matter. You know, maybe that... I mean, that's... For me, that's the other thing about photography. Instant gratification. You said about it before. Mm. It, it is so unimportant. 
I, what I want, I mean, you have to have a certain amount of graphication so that people will want to look at your images. That's understandable. But really, you want people to come back to that image again and again. Now, when I am producing a book, which is all I really do, um, I want people to have that book, like I have photographic books, that they just keep, oh, and pick it up, and they sit down on a rainy day and they look at it. But if it's instant gratification, you may never want to look at it again. Yeah, it's so interesting you talk, talking about books, because I was, I was reading up on Philip Jones Griffith School, we were going to see the exhibition up in Aberystwyth, and he said how important books were and how important photographic books were. I think they're and, and how crucial they were. And he was a great believer, of course. He, all his books have black and white photography. He didn't. He didn't indulge in colour at all no. in his uh, in his photographic books, uh, and the book element. And you self publish a, a lot of your books are self publish because I got complete control. Right. I mean, I'm taking photographs as if they're sentences. I'm put. I when I take a photo. I I mean, I when I did my degree and we worked in bodies of work, which we were you know encouraged to do. We weren't encouraged necessarily always to have any real connection with the images. The images weren't necessarily connected. They, we, we would juxtapose. I mean, my tutors were amazing. And the reason I went to Nottingham was because of them. Um, and to a degree, they were interested in how photographs fed off each other. Mm. What I'm interested in now is taking that much, much further. You know, the, uh, I don't want an individual image and another individual image that I tell people is connected and I put them in a body of work so they know they're connected, and then don't under, and then bemoan the fact they don't understand what I'm saying. Well, maybe people won't understand what I'm saying. I mean, that's the struggle with photography. It doesn't really have a set language. We have um, we have all the people out there who look at photography. It's as if they've all got these little phrase books. Yeah. Do you think Do you think um, p- people are photographically illiterate then? Oh, definitely. Sense? But that's not their fault. We, I mean, how many schools teach visual communication? Mm. And it's as if it happens naturally. It doesn't happen naturally. Yeah. Um, so I'm always trying to help people. I, on my on the surface, I try to make my images as pleasing to look at as possible. But on, uh, but then under that, I'm really, really trying to make them have depth. And then not only depth, have connections. When I take one image, I've either taken it because it goes with another image, or I've got another image in mind that's going to go with it. I couldn't take an individual image. I couldn't think, oh, that's nice, click. I just, I couldn't do it. And the images have to link. They visually link you know that if if i'm having two images together there has to be something that holds them together Mm. now there are some traditional ways of doing that if you photograph the same thing from the same spot again and again and again you know the traditional one is photograph something for a year once a month Mm. and have it changing the seasons well 30 years ago that was very valid now it's very boring um because it's been done so much Mm. But it doesn't mean it shouldn't be done. I, in my Beating the Bounds, I do that. Because it's a handle. It helps people to understand you've got to help people. Because we haven't learned to read at school. And actually, there isn't a, a set-down visual language. Yeah. Do you, think, do you think people have a fallback? I, I, I kind of get a feeling that there's a fallback. And people just slot back into the cliche. Because the cliche is comfortable. Oh, and they understand it. Yeah. And anything that pushes things... So many photographers through. don't want anybody to say, oh, I don't like that. They're scared stiff of it. It's like people dressing. Most people buy clothes that people will not come up to them and say, oh, God, what do you look like? You know, they, they won't do it. They'll buy clothes that make them anonymous. Or you get the occasional person that could be flamboyant. But on the whole, we all dress to blend in in our with our tribe nearly always um so photographers do the same i think and and they do you know the the terrible thing about photography in the last 20 years where the hell has critical analysis gone in Mm. photography Mm. people are scared stiff Mm. to say anything i mean if i see a photograph that is an absolute replica of somebody else's photograph I'll tell you, I'll say, well, why have you copied this person's photograph? And they say, and they they usually turn around to me and they say, oh, well, that view's not his. 
I say, excuse me, views are free to everybody. I totally agree with you. But a view is a blooming big place, a big thing. And you can move around in views. The way I look at it is views are made up of aspects. Trees, clouds, mountains, whatever you want to say. Those aspects are a bit like words. Now, the writer doesn't have to make up his own words. He draws on the dictionary and he chooses words. And then the way he puts those words together make it his. And if you use the same combination of words, that's plagiarism. Mm. In a photograph, if you move around in the landscape and get to a point where the aspects in the photograph are lined up in the same way as another photographer, that's plagiarism. Mm. But nobody says it. And, and if you do say it, people jump up and down and say, oh, it's sour grapes and other such nonsense. Mm. When I was, did my degree, we ripped each other to pieces. Mm. Uh, and you had to justify what you were doing. Yes. I don't see that at all now. No, I see uh, people going, nice capture, nice yes. shot, pat, pat, pat. Yes. Uh, it was it was strange because I went to um, uh, some enterprising young students who were in their, two in their second year, one was in their first year, and they got a gallery going, they'd done some work, and they showed the work, and there was a, a sort of a, a theme to it all, and uh, and I went to see the work, and the one thing they craved was criticism, because they are never ever criticised properly yeah. in the institution where they're at. They are criticised, but it's all soft spoken criticism. Yes. There was never any hard criticism, you know. And I I, I criticised some uh, some other photographs, and you know, they, because they were underexposed. But I, yeah, do you, do you know what I mean? You need criticism. I'm yeah. unbelievably lucky. I've got a handful of photographers who I admire and are friends with, and I send my work to them, huh. and yes. and they pull me up. You know, I say, oh, you know, I really felt that this does the job, and they say, well, I can't see it. You know, why do you think it does? Hmm. And I say, well, this, this, and this. And they say, well, sorry, that's all in your head. <laughs> and and you need that. And then you go away and you rethink it. Yes. And I think it's just so important. You know, when I'm taking photographs, even, even things that I'm passionate about, I mean, my passion about helping people link images, well, it may not work. So I use refrains through images. I will have a shape that runs from one image to another. And... Because when I did my first show of Beating the Bounds, which was about two and a half years into the project, just to help promote it and, and what have you, I put up two images that I felt were unbelievably connected, but they were connected basically in my head. But I put them next to each other and I put a gap before the next images. So I thought I was helping people see them. And I watched, and I watched people go up, and I watched them look at one as if it was some standalone painting or something. And then they, I could see them switching off from it and looking at the next one individually. And I was going, no, 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 that's not the way to do it. And then it suddenly dawned on me afterwards, well, it wasn't their fault. It was my fault. I was the one that made the mistake. So then I started looking, how can I join images together, help them visually join images? And I I, I'm really into classical music and I love the symphony. And it suddenly dawned on me that the movements of a symphony can be completely disparate. They can not have any connection at all until you start thinking about it. And then there's always some something in there, maybe a refrain that runs through yeah. and it helps pull them together. Well, so I'll do that. You know, I'll, I'll have shapes that echo from one image to the other. But then life got difficult because... If you need the, the shape, as well as the composition, as well as the event, it makes life difficult. But then who said photography shouldn't be difficult? Um, so that's what I do now. I, and that's why I need long periods of time. If, if you've got an image and you know you need another image... So, for instance, in the, in the Darrow project, I've got lots of these things going on. And one of the... I don't know what you would call them. That's the other problem. There's no... Di there's no no, there isn't a big breadth of words to describe photography. You know, like there is literature. I have to keep thinking, how can I describe this? There isn't a word for it. Uh, so I, some sort of device that, that helps people link. And one of the things I've been coming up with, and there's an image down there, where I have a splash of white in the cent dead centre in the image, in, in the shot we're looking at. It's a, it's a Japanese saw glinting in the, uh, in the, in the sunlight. But then in the next image, it might be, there's one behind it, where there's two balls of white um, in the same section. Mm -hmm. Or it might be 
a butterfly or anything that's white, but it, it then helps pull those images together. Yes. And then if I also then, when I do the book layout, I maybe put them in a sequence from page to page where they're not obviously connected, but people get used to seeing them in the same place, maybe that will work. Yeah. So I'm always trying to think, how can I help people? Because, you know, they aren't going to know what I want or know. And there isn't a, you know, in literature, there's a set way of doing things and we've all learned to do it. So we understand. Right. But is it is it incumbent on us as photographers then to be like you are, educating people in how to look at photography and to look at images? I think so. I think we should have a passion. We should be pushing the bounds. We shouldn't be falling, going back into the past, unless you're going to take something from the past and bring it forward and give it a good shaking uh, and use it again. But if you don't do that, you know... But then it's not upon everybody to educate. I mean, I feel passionate about trying to be, I, be, I believe photography can be so much more than it is. And if it carries on being, let's make the images bigger, let's rely on detail, let's um, always photograph water blurred because it's so beautiful, let's always, you know, so on and so forth, let's use these uh, templates because everybody knows them, or let's, you know, rely on you know, technology or the next cameras will be bigger and better. Let's use that. And to be able to show it's bigger and better, you know, the image has to be bigger and bigger. Um, yeah. and, and why? <laughs> and I went to a gallery once and the guy was selling his work. The images were passable at best. Um, and you had to stand back with your back up against a far wall just to look at them. But he wasn't selling them like that. He was taking people right up to them. And he was saying, now look at that feather floating on the water. Look how you can see every, whatever, the section of a, you know, the barbs yeah, on it. Yeah. How you can see them. And I thought, okay. <laughs> but what's that got to do with anything? Yeah. Uh, 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 I'm going to take you back a bit. Now. Yeah, go on. Sorry, I, uh, I no, digress. No, 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 you're not digressing at all. It's a fabulous, fabulous conversation. Um, uh in a way, going back to your five fields and the Dorog uh, project, yes. uh, you're actually taking photographs with your feet in a way. And I, I don't mean that in a disparaging way, but you're using your, I mean, it's that physical walking and being in a landscape and um, and it's, it's kind of a, it's like a, um, uh, how would I describe it? Uh, it's like a pilgrimage. Um, Is yes. it a pil- or am I, I don't being... know. I, I, I don't know. I, I love being there. I love there being there so that I can get to know it. I, the more I'm there, the more I know. Therefore, I don't believe you can photograph what you don't know. You know, that's the trouble with going to exotic places and, and things yes. like that. You don't know anything about it. No. Um, so you, for me, you have to know... What you're photographing, but that so takes that means an, being there. Yeah, but that takes an awful lot of discipline as well, Chris. But it? every job takes discipline. It does indeed, you know, yes. I mean, I'm, I'm always having that. People come in the gallery and they say, oh, you must be so patient. And I think, why? I'm not patient at all, but it's the job I'm doing. Hmm. And I go and do it. You know, they've got a job, they go and do it. They don't think, oh, you know, I, I haven't got the energy to do that today. Or, or, you know, like this morning. I mean, saying that, if it's sunny, I have real problems. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Not because I want to be in the sun, because I actually hate the sun, but I can't take photographs in the sun. No. I find the sun... I mean, I couldn't live in California or somewhere. <laughs> I, I mean, not... I, when I... I mean, outside the Darrell Project, but uh, with the Darrell Project, I want to be able to circumnavigate my subject and be able to take a photograph whenever I like. Well, you can't do that when it's bright sun. You know, you're 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 restricted into a sh- very small area of possibilities. Well, I don't want that. That's too mm. blooming restrictive. Mm. Um, I want to tell a story, and if it means um, you know going around the other side of the subject to tell the proper story to put the thing in context, that's what I want to do. Um, and I and and you were saying about being cl- you know going there and being cl- for me it's all about being close so that's why i'm using a 75 mil lens yes. if you want to photograph a cuckoo which i'm doing at the moment with a 75 mil lens you've got to be close yeah. and so therefore you have to work out a way of doing it you know i don't want to be the person with the binoculars i want to be 
getting to know my subject, letting them get to know me. So it's been taking me three years to get to know the Ravens. When I first started, as soon as I got over the style, they were gone. Yeah. Now I can get within, I don't know, 100 yards without them flying off. And it's getting better all the time because they're getting to know me. But I can only do that by being there a lot. Yes. And I could have, on the first day, put a 1,000mm lens on yes. and took a photograph from the style. Yes, indeed. But I don't yes. see the point. No. Uh, um, uh, no, and uh, uh, um, the one thing I notice about your photography, you don't photograph people at all. Oh, I do. You do? Yeah, oh God, if there were people, I'd photograph them more. It's right. not my fault that there's no <laughs> blooming people there. <laughs> I love photographing people. Um, on the Dowrog, I'm really lucky. When I was working in the fields, well, nobody goes to fields. I mean, they're, pri they're private. The farmer came in three times a year, four times a year. Didn't get out of his tractor. He's hermetically sealed in. Um, he, you know, he came to plough. He came to, to um, seed. He came to um, fertilise. And he came to reap. And he never got out of his tractor. So how the hell do I photograph him? I mean... I'm doing a project um, documenting the decline of dairy, or not the decline of dairy farms, a changing face of dairy farms. Right, okay. um, the first project I did, when I went in now, I was thinking, yes, I'm going to get photographing people again, mm. until I found out about the farm. And the farm was in decline because there was no money in dairy. The poor guy was having to work every hour God sent in different farms to keep the money coming in. Again, when he was there... He was in his metically sealed units, so mm. it was hard to photograph him. And then it suddenly struck me that the the way to photograph this farm, and that's the other thing, you don't photograph things from your point of view. You should never do that. You sh you've got to find out something about what you're photographing and yeah. try to photograph it, if, yeah. even if it doesn't work. You've got to try to photograph mm. it from that point of view. Mm. So the point of view of that farm was, it was derelict almost. It was empty. Mm. Nature was in close, you know, he couldn't re have time to in all the money to repair things. Mm -hmm. He couldn't be there. So the farm, the things that were there were the wildlife. So that's what you should be photographing, the cows with the wildlife, with the falling down hedges and fences, and him struggling yeah. to keep on top of it and, and keep the money coming. And so, yeah. Whereas the farm I'm hoping to photograph soon... They've got 300 cows or 400 cows. They've built cow motorways. They're really there. They're on hand. But again, they're still in their hermetically sealed containers. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be difficult. Mm -hmm. um, but no, on the down log, I'm lucky. About three times a year, Nathan and his volunteers come down and I photograph them. Um, and I love photographing. I love photographing people. Well, before I came to Pembrokeshire, that's all I did. Right, I okay. photograph people. All right. Okay. Uh, so no, I don't not photograph people. It's just that right. there's not enough people. <laughs> <laughs> and I go down on the Dowrog, and two weeks ago there were three people on the Dowrog. I mean that was heaving. That's the busiest I've seen it down there for yonks. Yeah. And they, uh, but they'd only come down to look at the dragonflies. Right. Um, it's. And it is harder to photograph people nowadays. I mean, when I used to photograph people, I did a project documenting the people in the British Museum. I did that for three or four years. Um, and people were easy to photograph now. Uh, then, I mean, sorry. Now, it's the opposite. People are either posing all the time, putting on their Twitter faces, or whatever you call them, their Facebook faces, or they're saying, what are you up to? You know, why are you photographing me? Um... You know, yeah. where's, where's this going to end up? Yeah. Well, it wasn't like that. In the past, people either ended up ignoring you or, or they were quite pleased to be photographed. Yeah. Um, but they weren't trying to... I don't know, people want to put on their best face now. There's become a, a way of being in a photograph that is so different. You know, picture post and, and, uh, and um, magazines like that, I don't know how they... You know, if they revive them now, how that would work? I don't think it would work. No, uh, because um, and uh, unlike um, p portrait photographers, if you like, or um, uh, uh, of yesteryear, they spent time. You know, it was mm. they were spending six months with people. You know, with families, and they were documenting things in the same way that you're documenting things. The amount of you said earlier when, when we were off mic that nine years is nothing for a project. It's 
I, I guess. In the it, countryside, it's not. It's I mean, don't not. get me wrong. Yeah. Somebody can go in for five minutes and produce something extraordinary. I'm not saying that it... But it, the way I work and what I want to tell people and show people, nine years is nothing. You know, mm-hmm. very little changes in the landscape in nine years. Do you, after you, after a day's shoot or going out, um, going out in the morning, going out in the evening, whatever, do you, do you return home and look at those pictures immediately? I work straight on them. I, mean, I, 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 it's terrible in this household. I'm the chef. Um, so it's my job to provide the food. And I come back and I've got seven or eight images from the day, which is a lot for me. Um, and I, I just want to work on them. And I can't. I've got to cook a meal, you know. And, and, I, and, then, I'll, and then we have this sort of, you know, how families have rituals. And I'll, we have a ritual of, of, of watching something with my son. And, um, so I, I have to work on them straight away because when I am taking the photograph, I have something in mind. Now, I have a terrible memory, and it would be so easy for me to forget what that something was. You know, they're not just nice images. You know, I mean, I hope they're nice images, but that's not why I'm taking them. They have a purpose. They must have a purpose. Otherwise, I mean, a friend of mine up in Nottingham and I are always talking about this. You know, the only important thing in photography, I mean, really, the only thing that's important is the why. Why are you doing it? The next thing is who. Who's it for? And if it's for yourself or your family or for people that have never met you and know nothing about it. And the why is, and the how are, the, are fundamental to any photograph. And if I forget the why I took a photograph, um, then I might as well bin it, um, even if it looks nice, because I won't be able to use it. Um, it's a bit like writing a sentence and then forgetting what part of the book it was going to go in. So do you, um, I mean, I know this is a kind of maybe a bit sort of techy, but uh, do you, uh, you edit? Do you edit, put them to one side? Do you revisit those edits that you've done? Or? Oh, God, yeah. Um, I'm old-fashioned. Under this table we're sat at, under my hat. Yes. If you lift my hat up, yes. you will see work uh, prints. Yes. Now, they're all my work prints. I have to, as soon as I've finished the image, I print it out on a piece of A4 rubbishy paper, I laminate it so it looks like it's expensive paper. <laughs> <laughs> and then I have piles of them. And then in, on days when I'm on my own or, or there's nobody in the gallery, I lay them out on the floor. And I juggle them and I look for new ideas. I have to be looking at my images all the time. Especially if you're working for nine years. Mm-hmm. I mean, how are you going to remember something you did? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm also producing the book all the time. So, you know, I bring up my, my book... <laughs> And I'm juggling the images and I've got pages. So yeah, I'm coming up to my first end of my first three years down on the Dow Rock. Yeah. Now, technically, that means my first book should be ready. I have endless holes in that book where I know I have to have images. I can't not have images. The, the other image will mean nothing, even though it's nice. It'll be absolutely pointless. So I would have to get rid of that image and shorten the book and... And my goal with this book is is to really go for it with the amount of images I use. So how critical are you of your own work? Oh, God, too critical. I yeah. mean, I everything has to be I, I, perfect for me. I mean, and it's it for me. I mean, other people won't notice it. I mean, I, I was working this morning, just before you came, I'm, I'm working on one of my web shots. Uh, that, Double meaning, doesn't it? Photograph of a spider web. Now, how do you photograph spider webs? They're ah. such a cliche thing, aren't yes, they? they? Especially are. if they've got dew on them. Absolutely. But of course, the dew makes them stand out. So it's a wonderful thing to have on yeah. them. So I'm struggling with this. And then suddenly I notice that there's this piece of grass which has been pulled round. And I've taken maybe four shots of it. Um, I tend to do a burst of four or five or six <laughs> or however many is necessary. When things are kinetic. And when yeah. you get close to things, they become more kinetic. You know, when the wind's blowing yeah, something, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's all over. I can't see when that piece of grass is in exactly the right place. So I have to do that afterwards. Mm. Um, and then I suddenly notice that in one of the shots, there's this sort of ball of light reflecting off the water in the distance. And in one of the shots, it's lined up with the piece of grass. 
that that is a necessary for me. I, and nobody else is going to notice it. It's ridiculous. <laughs> but it's like it's like a writer getting exactly the right word or getting the comma in exactly the right place. Mm. It, it, you have to have these um, benchmarks for yourself, even if nobody else is going yeah. to Eve ever see it. I mean, Do you find um, working on these extended projects that uh, come year three, the stuff you were doing in year one, isn't or doesn't fit in oh with God, your... Oh, God, it's difficult. Having I mean, that continu- be... No, continuity is a nightmare. Oh, yeah. The biggest continuity problem I've had is with the Quiet Storm project. Mm-hmm. I mean, in 2000, I took the first photograph on film, and it's the one behind you there of, of Strumble Head. Yeah. And it's, um, it's taken on Fuji. Yeah. Um, I loved Fuji. I loved the fact that... I mean, it's always been the one thing I love about photography more than anything is is the fact that photographs can't show reality. Okay. But everybody believes they can. I mean, that's the magical thing about photography. Um, and, of course, choosing your film in the past was all about how you show the world. It wasn't about reality. Mm-hmm. You know, you use Kodak, you had a rose-tinted view yeah, of the world. Indeed, yes, you yes. use Agfa, you had yeah. a cold Germanic feel. Yes. You use Fuji, you had a kiddies version of the world. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I mean, so um, I used Fuji. Now, the first shot was taken on Fuji, but then t- two years later, when I was taking the next photograph, I've moved into digital. Um, the digital photo camera I've got at the time in 2002 was something like five or six megapixels, which was pretty good then. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's no detail in a A2 five megapixel image, uh, especially cropped to a square. Mm. So, you know, you get an image like that. I mean, well, sorry, people can't see, but yeah. um, an image where... It's a, a five megapixel image printed to A2. I mean, the resolution's brilliant. I'm using a really good lens. But there's no detail, just yeah. the illusion of detail. Yes. So that was the first jump in continuity. And then suddenly, years pass. And that camera, that first camera, well, it broke down. And I look on the internet and I find you can't really get replacements. <laughs> and then I had a seven-year gap with no images in that project. You know, I mean, I've been working on that project for 15 years. I've got 13 photographs. Because these things I'm photographing are rare. They, and not only are they rare, the chances of being there when they happen is even harder. Yeah. So I had a seven-year gap with nothing, in which time the cameras died. And I'm thinking, well, what do I do next? And by which time I've bought a Nikon. And the Nikon's 28 megapixels. Oh, well, that's a hell of a difference. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> um, so I go for an image where I have a 5 megapixel one of a patchwork quilt, which is uh, one of my locations. But then 10 years later, I take one with a 28 megapixel camera, and they don't look the same. They look totally different. So I, it worried me for ages. And then I suddenly thought, well, it's going to be in a book if I don't die first, um, because it's such a slow project. But um, what I'll do is I will use the same locations, but I'll change them slightly. Um, That was my initial idea. So in the first one where it happened, I'm on the side of Penberry looking at Carn Cliddy, and I'm low down, and I've got the C in on the um, right-hand side. Um, So I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll move further up Carn Cliddy, uh, Mm. Penberry, Mm. And by doing that, I'm going to take the C out on the right, but by gaining height, I'm going to bring it in on the left. So it's the same view, but slightly different. And the idea was to do that with every shot. And then there would be a distinct chapter. There'd be, this is the first 12 images over the first 13 years. And then the next chapter will be the next 13 years or whatever. Um, and it will be a different series. You know, it will look different, but it will also be different. And then I suddenly looked at my first shot I took. I thought, there is absolutely no way I can recompose Strumble Head. Mm. It's just far too strong a composition. Um, so that went out the window. <laughs> but I'm hoping that by doing it in two chapters, I can show that thing. But it's you're right, the continuity over that period is difficult. Mm. Um, 
And it's also difficult in my head because I'm changing yeah. over that time. I mean, the way well, you're learning more about yeah. where you are. And is it and right to go on with a project for 15 years? I, I'm coming to question that. I mean, I say to you, I really need nine years or more to photograph somewhere. But if, if I change so much, my views on photography change so much over those years, and I hope they do. Mm-hmm. God, I, hope, I don't want to. Just, you know, be fixed. Mm. Um, then, is it right to be carrying on? I question myself with my Quiet Storm pro- project. I think, should I carry on with it? Yeah. You know, I don't feel like this anymore. I'm photographing from the past. Yeah. I'm using my twelve compositions I came out with. 